Hey, let's start off with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. We just are grateful for a room that is full, eager to hear your word. Uh, Lord, it just uh, warms our heart. Uh, Lord, we pray that you speak, us, speak to us today through your word. Um, Lord, we are also grateful for good reports we've heard for um, healing that you've presented, you've done this week, performed this week. Lord, we just praise and glorify you for being a God of miracles. That means a lot to us. Um, Lord, we also want to pray for uh, one of our graduates, Sarah Lance. Sarah is a was a missionary doctor. She's 34 years old, uh, biochemistry or biology student, Lord. Um, missionary doctor who came down with cancer. Now, Lord, it's spread throughout our body. She just came down with pneumonia. She's in the hospital today, Lord. So we just pray for a healing on her, that you help take away the coughing fits, and that you help heal Sarah. Lord, uh, she's one of ours, so we pray for her. Lord, we love you, and just speak to us today. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right, I want to start off today, and I want to ask for the gentleman... Uh, to raise your hand if you think you can beat me up. Raise your hand. So I'm five six. I weigh, you know, <clears throat> too much. And, uh, you tell me if you think you can take. No, keep them up. I want to see. There's none of this height. Brett, really? All right, come on. Let's see. Derek, you think I'm That's good. Go ahead and keep it up. Yeah, probably. <laughs> then I think you and I would have a good outrun. We'd have a good round. We'd have a good round. I can give a punch, but I can't. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. I'll get the first lick in. All right. Uh, I'm not offended. I'm not offended if you think you can take it. I'm just glad other ladies participate. <laughs> um, I'm not offended, but sometimes I start to think about how we view Jesus. And I start to get offended, I think, of sometimes the way he's portrayed. Now, there's some paintings here on campus that are great paintings. If you're not seeing the Warner Solomon painting, you should go see them. But I want to show you some, some of these paintings here on campus. And if I say, what does Jesus look like to you? This might be what you think. This is one of the most famous viewings or, or pictures of what Jesus looks like. So the, the head of Christ. And it's just a wonderful picture. I mean, I've seen people looking at this painting and you know, tears coming out of their eyes. And they see Jesus. Here's another one that you might recognize. This is over, this is A.U. owns this painting, it's here. Uh, Jesus knocking on the door of your heart, you can kind of see the heart in there. Uh, so all kinds of hidden, hidden things in this. Uh, but I put a background color to kind of give me a feel that I get when I watch this. Kind of a, a minty green kind of feeling. Kind of um, and then if I say, you know, Jesus, what does he, what does he look like to you? This is a lot of times what we see. Jesus, head and sheep. And I've been reading the Gospels again this week, and nowhere in there do I see him petting sheep. <laughs> but, uh, he's usually walking around petting sheep, and this Jesus I think I could take. <laughs> uh, maybe not. But you start looking at Jesus, and sometimes I start to get offended. That the Jesus that we think is this nice, always just nice. What's Jesus just nice? Why did they kill Jesus? He's too nice. <laughs> and we start getting this view of Jesus, and sometimes it makes me think, um, that, I don't know, I see some other things, some, another side of Jesus in Scripture, and that's what I wanted to do today, just kind of jump into the life of Jesus, and see the way he really talked about himself at times. And sometimes what he says, we just kind of skip over and ignore. So I want to point to Jesus' own words, these words of power that he speaks, and this voice of authority that he has, um, and maybe change the way that we look at Jesus at times. Um, so what I want to do is jump in. We're going to go see all these tattoos are off you. <laughs> we'll see how we do. But I want to jump into Matthew, uh, uh, book of Matthew. We're going to start just with Jesus' ministry. The first thing Jesus does when he goes into ministry is he fasts. Forty days, he doesn't eat any food. Forty days or nights. I've made it like 40 minutes before. Forty days without eating. Anybody gone 40 days before without eating? I can't, I mean, I can't really imagine that. I've gone, I have gone like one day, right? And I mean, I am so hungry at the end of that day. 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, that's when Satan comes to him. So he's at his weakest physically, and Satan comes to Jesus and starts to tempt him. And I just love the way Jesus, so he's at his weakest, and he says, Satan, get away from him. He speaks with authority. It is, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
then he just that's in chapter four, and then in chapter five he starts talking to the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees. So the Pharisees, they are let's just face it, they're better than you. The Pharisees, <laughs> the Pharisees memorized the entire first books of the Bible. No, not again. They, I mean, they look good. The Pharisees look good. And Jesus comes to the Pharisees, and in chapter 5, verse 20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of these Pharisees, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Basically, he says, unless you're better than these guys, these guys that look perfect, you're going to hell. Which really is saying, see these guys right here? They're going to hell. That's how he starts off his ministry, talking to the most religious people and saying, they're not going to make it. Then he takes it, and it doesn't matter who he's talking to, whether it's poor people or rich people. In chapter 6, he goes after rich people. Here's what he says in uh, where, chapter 6, verse 24. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So he goes to the rich, wealthy people today, and he says, serve both money and me. I am more important than money. It goes right after him. It doesn't matter if he's talking to the lowest class people or the richest people. He's just going to tell them the way it is. He says, in fact, you shouldn't worry about that at all. I am God. You should worry about me. And he says, you shouldn't worry about what you're, anything about your life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Those things shouldn't matter to you because I will provide. I am God. And then he talks about judgment chapter 7. And this one really scares me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles, or did we not do that? And he said, I will tell them plainly, away from me, I never do. Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. Chapter 8, verse 1, chapter by chapter. Chapter 8, there's a big storm. And there are, Jesus and the disciples are on a boat, and waves are crashing over, and the wind's coming, and the boat's rocking, and Jesus is sleeping. And they're like freaked out. And they're like, uh, oh, what are we gonna, we're going to die here. And Jesus wakes up. And he says, oh, you little faith, why are you so afraid? And he just speaks out, he's like, all right. And all of a sudden, shoo, the storm just settles down. The wind stops, and the sea is just kind of calmed down. And they freak out. They're like, who is this guy? That he can talk to the wind, he can talk to the water, and they obey who he is. And then, also in chapter 8, Jesus is just walking with the disciples, and they're in a city called Gadarenes, I think is how you say it. And there's two demon-possessed men, and they're walking, and these guys are creating havoc. People won't even walk down the street because they're so violent. They're, they're beating up people. And Jesus walks up with these two demons, and they say, what are you doing here? Who's the son of God? This is the son of God. And they're saying, um, what are you doing here? And they said, is, is the time here for you to torture us now? Uh, before the appointed time, so they just are freaked out. And in the name of Jesus, they are petrified. And I think so So often we walk around and talk about Jesus, and we're just awfully cocky around him. We want to kind of give him advice every once in a while. I think you shouldn't have said it this way, Jesus. I think you should have done it this way. That this is really the, the nicer way to say that. And we kind of set it up for him. And here we see that when it comes to the, de the demons, they just shudder at the name of Jesus. And they, then the people come around. The whole town, it says, come out to meet Jesus. They hear about it. Cast away these demons. And the whole town comes out. And then, I don't know if you saw this before, but it says, and when they saw him, they pleaded with Jesus to leave their region. Like, we, you are just too powerful for us. You call the wind and the seas. You cast demons out. We don't want any part of this. We want you just to leave. Chapter 9, Jesus comes, there's, they bring a, on a stretcher, a paralytic, a guy paralyzed to him. Jesus just looks down and says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk out of here. And the 
God gets up and does it. Now imagine if we brought in somebody today who's been paralyzed, you know their whole life, they've never been able to walk. And they come in and I say, get up and walk. And they stood up and walked. Just imagine how freaked out you would be. Rob, you wouldn't think you'd beat me up anymore if I was able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the power that he had, just get up and walk out. And they praised God who had given such authority to men. All right, chapter 10. Jesus says some really harsh words in chapter 10. He says, he talks about being afraid of people. He says, don't be afraid of people who can kill your body. He said, you're all going to die someday. What are you afraid of them for? All they can do is kill you. He said, what you really ought to be afraid of? He says, rather be afraid of me, the one who can destroy your body and send you to hell. Those red letters. <laughs> he says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill your soul. He said, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's Jesus talking about. And he goes on to say, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But if you disown me, if you disown me before men, if you want to pretend like you don't know me, he said, then I'll disown you before the Father in heaven. That's what Jesus says. Then he goes on to say, if you love your mother and father, he says, anyone who loves your mom more than me, you don't deserve me. You love your kids? It's good to love your kids, but you love them more than me. You don't deserve me. It's right here. Chapter 10, verses 37 to 39. Anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Not worthy of me. Anyone who does not think, anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of it. He demands all of it, our total love and our total following. Not just part of it. Not just, well, I'm, you know, I really love my kids. I have three kids. And I love my wife, too. I should throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus says, Wallace, you love them more than me. That's not enough. You're not worthy of it. You should know how much I deserve your total following. Then he says, anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of it. He says, if your stuff matters to you more than me, if your sin matters more to you than me, you don't deserve it. And I'm not going to play second fiddle. I'm not going to beg you. He says, I deserve all of you. I am that glorious. He says, I am that good. I am that powerful. You should fear me. You should follow me. You ought to fear me, he says. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, God says. Then he just talks about entire cities. Chapter 11, verse 24, he says, um, um, he's talking about different cities. He said, you know, I've done miracles in these cities, and they still don't follow me. He doesn't get it. It's like I, I tell them about me, and they don't follow me. So he says, um, he says to these cities, he names several of them, entire cities. And he says, um, I tell you that it would have been more bearable for Sodom, the city that he destroyed on Judgment Day, is going to be for you. Entire cities, he says, you wish you were sorry for what I did to them and what's going to happen to this city. Then he starts talking about the end, end times. And he comes, like chapter 13, he says, uh, oh, this is so good. So this is what it's going to look like at the end times. This is what it's going to be like when you see Jesus. If Jesus is to come back, it's not... That Jesus, I don't know if I should keep it on there, because I want to tell you about this Jesus. It's not going to be that Jesus, it's this Jesus. He says, the Son of Man, so when I come back, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will, so he's like, I'm going to come back. He says, I'm going to bring all my angels with me, all of them. So imagine Jesus with a hundred million angels coming in, right? And then he says, here's what I'm going to do. He says, um, I'm going to sit on my throne, I'm going to gather all the nations together, and look at all the people, he says, then I'm going to start saying, taking some of them saying, you are on this side. You are on this side. And he says, um, the angels and I will weed out and everything that causes sin and all good to evil. I will throw them in the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Well, come on up. All right, you're on that side. Come on up. You're on that side. 
It's not this. You touch this road. It's like you're over here. <laughs> <laughs> you throw them in the fiery furnace. We'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, I don't like that. Let's just ignore that he said that. That's what we do, right? Let's, let's pretend like he didn't say that. Because maybe you came in here today, you want me to talk about the next Jesus. And maybe you're starting to feel like, I didn't know about that. Let's go talk about that Jesus. He said those things. Um, let's, just, let's just ignore it. That's okay. And then, uh, then chapter 14, Jesus is walking on water. And the disciples are freaking out. And they think it's a ghost. He's like, don't be afraid. It's just me. Take courage. Chapter 15, um, it, again, he goes after the Pharisees. He's just always after the Pharisees, the religious leaders who are really sinful people, who are really prostitutes on the inside. He just keeps going after them. And this is awesome in chapter 15. The disciples come to Jesus. This is chapter 15, verse 12 of Matthew. Then the disciples came to him, to Jesus, and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard what you said? <laughs> like, uh, you said a few things there, Jesus. I think they're offended. And Jesus says, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he doesn't. Wait a minute. He doesn't say that. And it's so funny, isn't it? They're like, uh, they were offended. And isn't that the way we are? We're like, I'm offended. And our offense trumps anything else. I don't care if what you said is what Jesus said or not. I was offended. Wallace, I came to chapel today, and I was offended at what you said about Jesus. I didn't write any of it. I'm just reading what he said. I'm kind of offended. Okay, let's just ignore that. Then, right? Our offense is the biggest, most important thing. I hope I don't offend you. Jesus says, you're not going to die. What are you worried about if they kill you? What are you worried if they write you a strongly worded email? <laughs> you tell them what I said. He said, okay, I'll tell them, God. Right. Here's what Jesus says, though. And they're like, oh, Jesus, I think they're offended. Jesus says, don't worry about that. He said, leave them alone. They're just blind. It's the blind leading the blind. And when the blind leads the blind, they just fall into the hands. Don't worry about that. He just said, they're blind. They'll fall into a pit. Chapter 16, he's talking to Peter. And he says, Peter, who do you think I am? Peter says, I believe you're the Christ. And he says, Peter, upon you I will build my church. Upon this rock I will build my church. And then he says, and the gates of hell won't be able to stand against my church. He said, they're going to come against it. He said, but I am building the church. They're going to kill a bunch of you. It's just going to spread like wildfire. wildfire. He's, he's like, I'm going to build a church. The devil or nobody can do anything about it. The gates of hell will not overcome it. Chapter 18, he's telling a parable about um, being unforgiving. And he says, um, he said, you know, I, the master forgave the servant, and he should be forgiving too. But if he's not, he says, in his anger, the master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And he said, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you if you're unforgiving, unless you forgive your brother from your earth. It's like he's cast him out, tortured him. Chapter 19, he goes after the rich people again. He says, I tell you the truth, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that one I don't like. Because you and I are rich. Right? You may not feel like you're rich yet, but you're rich. And I know I'm richer than most of you. I have a job. <laughs> uh, not real rich. Compared to American standards, but yeah. Uh, I've got some money. He says, I tell you the truth. He says, I tell you the truth. It's hard. It's really difficult. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He says, you know, if you, have only, if you only have 20 bucks, he said, if you only have 20 bucks in, you might be able to do that, even though it's your last 20. He said, what do you do if it's 2,000 bucks? Can you give all that to me? How about 20,000? 200,000? 2 million? He says, you've got some money. He says, it's really hard. Your stuff becomes pretty important to you. All of a sudden, you start to feel like Maybe you're a little better than somebody else. You got a little, maybe you have a little more power than somebody else, more influence. And you start to rely on yourself a little too much. He said, it's really hard to give that up to get in the, king, in the kingdom of God. He said, in fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is. He said it. And he starts talking about his death. 
starting in chapter 20. And this is when you really see the power of Jesus coming. He starts telling his disciples, hey, I'm going to die. And he says, uh, we're going to Jerusalem. He said, and the Son of Man, he says, when we get there, he said, I'm going to be betrayed. Somebody's going to betray me. He said, the chief priests and the teachers of the law will take me. He said, then they're going to condemn me to death. They're going to turn me over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me. And they're going to flog me. And they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me on a cross. They're going to crucify me. So he's like, and they're like, well, you're powerful. We saw what you did with the wind and the waves. We know who you are. He's like, yeah, I know. But I'm going to let them do it to me anyways. Really? Why would you do that? Well, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing it for you. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to die and take on your sins. And he said, but don't worry. He said, when they kill me on the cross, he said, three days later, I'm going to rise again. He says, then I'm really going to show my power. I'm going to come back from life. So I'm going to come back to life. That's how powerful I am. And I'm going to take, it up, take all this on. All right, then here's the pacifist Jesus. In chapter 21, he makes a whip. He goes into the temple. And he really doesn't like people making, he doesn't like people taking advantage, like crooks and thieves taking advantage of his people. And really what he does here is, you know, people come and, and they're exchanging, they're selling stuff to him, but they're ripping off God's people is what it is. They're in his house in the temple and they're ripping off people. And to me, it's like he's indignant, like a televangelist, just rips off people. Send me your money and God will be good to you. He hates that. And here's what he does. He makes a whip and he goes into the temple and he just drives them all out, it says in chapter 21. He just whips them, gets them out of there, kicks over the tables and says, you're not going to do this to my people. That's why Jesus is right there. Verse 42, he says, um, <coughs> he says, the stone the builders rejected, he's talking about himself, he's calling himself rock. The stone <laughs> that the builders rejected, he says, I'm going to be the cornerstone. That's the most important stone. Let's get this straight. So the stone that they rejected, I am going to be the cornerstone. And then he says, a couple verses later, he who falls on this stone is going to break. Just break, broke into pieces. It's like a piece of china. Falls on this stone, just destroyed. Just breaks apart. And he says, but it, and on whom this stone falls are just going to be crushed. He's like, I am so strong. I am the cornerstone, the foundation piece. The people who smash up against me just get destroyed. Nobody can stand against him. Then he goes to a parable about a wedding maker. And he says, um, this is not a wedding. Ken and Ryan, I hope this isn't what you're doing. There's a wedding banquet. And they invite people and nobody comes. So the king just gets angry. He goes off and, and he goes and kills all the people who have come. Then he burns down their city. Uh, but they deserve it. They were murdering people too, it says. And then, then he... Then he goes and invites other people when they come. And somebody comes to it and they're not wearing the right wedding clothes. And Jesus says, you know, he's like, friend, how do you get in here without your wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside. Into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited to fewer church. That's not just a wedding. It's talking about it. Then he goes back at the Pharisees in chapter 23. And this is where it is. It's like, whoa is you. I like that, whoa. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that guttural just make you feel sick. You ever felt that way? Oh, man, I feel bad for you. I hate, I'd hate to be you right now. <laughs> whoa, whoa is you. Whoa is you, you teachers in the law, you Pharisees, people who would look the best, the most religious. You're hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter. You're not going to get into heaven. Nor will you let those who are trying to be like you into heaven. He says, woe to you, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. He says, you look all over the world. You travel all over the world to try to get one single convert to be like you. And he says, and when you win them, he says, they're twice as much a son of hell as you are. And then he says, woe to you, you teachers of law and Pharisees. Hypocrites. He says, you're like a cup in a dish. He says, you're really clean and polished on the outside, just like the coffee cup in my office. You're really clean and, cup and polished on the outside, but the inside is filthy. <laughs> I haven't washed the inside. I have a coffee cup on my desk in the two and a half weeks for coffee. This is how disgusting I am. I have to clean the inside. 
What do you teach the law of Pharisees to be hypocrites? You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self indulgence. You're blind. It's first clean the inside of the cup. That's the one that matters, not the outside. And then he says, you know, I really like the, 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 the robes you wear, those, the sparkly robes. Those are really nice looking, really pretty on the outside. He said, it kind of reminds me, you're kind of like a tomb that's been cleaned and whitewashed on the outside, but on the inside there's dead, rotting people. Dead flesh, dead rotting bones. Pretty much what he says. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones and everything I mean. You really stink on the inside. It's more like that on the inside. Stop it, guys. In chapter 4, he's talking about when he returns again. And he says, Hey, I'm going to come back. He says, I'm going to die and I rose again. And I'm going to go back to heaven. And I'm going to come back someday. And he says, keep watch. He says, you're not going to know what it happens. He says, watch out. You're not going to know. He says, but the, when that day will come. He says, you've got to be ready. He says, be ready for when I come back. He said, I'll come in an hour when you don't expect it. And he says, it's kind of like a master, you know, and his servants. And the servants are screwing around, right? And the master walks in, all of a sudden, they're like, we're not supposed to be doing that. You ever have a part-time job where you do that? Walk, walk, walk. <laughs> I've done, I've done things that I'm not supposed to do, but I've had my part time job. I hope my boss doesn't work again. One time I went, I used to work at a pickle factory when I was uh, you know, right before college. I went, and I was supposed to go out and check the cucumbers one day. You go out, and, it, and it's, it's kind of a science thing. You dig down, and you get a random selection of cucumbers to bring back and to see what they're supposed to look like. And I shouldn't tell you this, but I went out there, and I climbed up on top of the cucumbers way out in the warehouse, and I fell asleep. <laughs> I fell asleep and took a nap on the and I woke up about 45 minutes later, and I'm like, oh, no. So I, I scoop up a bucket of cucumbers as fast as I could, and I ran back to the lab. And my boss says, where have you been? I said, boy, I, I said, I was just getting you a really good sample. I was digging all the All he did was scoop off the top and ran back. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but he's like, yeah, I'm coming back. And it's going to be like a servant who sees the, the, the master sees servants messing around. He cuts them up to pieces, he says, and throws them out with his weeping and ashing them. My boss would have been that. Right, so chapter 25, more of the same when he comes back. He's talking about servants. He's like, some of the servants, uh, it's a parable, we gave them money and they, they invested into well and they made more money. He's like, I want to come back and tell that servant, well done, and good faithful servant. He says, there's others the master gave money to and they squandered it away. He says, I want to tell them he says, you wicked and lazy servant. Throw the worthless servant outside in the darkness, and there'll be weeping and ashing of you. I tell you, he's going to come back, and I just want to be ready for him, and doing the things I should be doing. Like, right now, I want him to come back. Like, it's perfect. Right now. Because, like, in two hours, we're sleeping on top of the cameras. <laughs> no. He's, I'm secure either way. I'm not saying that's a whole other theology on this. <laughs> All right, he's talking about when he returns. Um, and then here's what it's going to look like. He says, when the Son of Man returns in his glory, this is in chapter 25, and all the angels are with him, he will sit on his throne and have the glory. This is what it's going to look like. He's coming back. It's, it's not going to be Jesus. He's sitting on a throne with millions of angels. And then he says, all the nations will be gathered before him, he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side and the goats on his left. Then he talks about how he's going to be betrayed. So he's warning his disciples. He says, I'm going to be betrayed. And Judas, of course, is the one that betrays him. And he says in chapter 26, he says, well, The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. I think Jesus, Judas is walking in. Woe to him who betrays me. It would be better for him if he had not ever been born. Then, uh, um, John 18, right? They come to arrest Jesus. And Jesus says, Who are you here to see? He knows exactly who they're here to see. Judas betrays him. Who are you here to see? And they say, uh, We're looking for Jesus. And he's like, Oh, I mean, and I just love what John 18 says. The whole army just falls down. They back up and they fall down to their faces and recognize who he is. 
Why don't you get up? Why don't you get back up? I know you're here to arrest me. But Peter grabs his sword, and Peter reaches out and cuts one of the guy's sword off. Gets his ear off. Jesus looks at him. Tell a story. He's like, Peter, what are you doing? And he says in, in <laughs> he says in the verse uh, 42, put your sword back away. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Peter, don't you think that I can call my father? He'll be he'll bring 12 legions of angels if I want him right now. He's like, I've got this. I've got 12 legions of angels here like that if I want. This reminds me back when I was in high school. I was playing pickup basketball. And this great opportunity, a guy from my high school wanted to be a pro NBA player. Uh, Scott Skiles is his name. He holds the record for the most assists in one game in the NBA three assists. When he comes back and he's playing for the Orlando Magic, I get to be on his team and pick up basketball. And he's guarding his guy, you know, and he's just so much better than anybody. You know, it's just unbelievable how much better than anybody I've ever seen. And we're playing, and this guy, this old guy comes down on the court, you know, he's guarding him. And this guy starts dribbling this way, and like I was taught, I'm guarding my guy, and I kind of help out a little bit, and come back. And he looks over and he says, I've got this. Don't worry about helping me. I <laughs> just thought, of course you do. <laughs> How stupid am I? No, I'm not comparing Scott Scott to Jesus. Scott did some other things in our <laughs> Put your sword back in the place. Then he goes before the high priest. Right? He's arrested. He's before the high priest. And he tells him, um, Jesus tells the high priest, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's how do you describe it? So, and then it just blows me away. So he's all powerful, this all powerful being, God made man, is standing there before him and he lets them put a blindfold on him. And they start to spit on him. This is what Jesus says to them. They start to slap him. And they start mocking him. One of them slaps him. And then they're, they're saying, prophesy to us, Christ. Who was it that just hit you? And he lets them do that for some reason. Because that's what he's called to do for us. That just pulls him away. And then the mocking continues. They take him away. Um, and then they, they, they strip him. And they put a scarlet robe on him. And they're mocking him. They twist some crowns of thorns. They put this thorn bush on his head. And they push it down. They put a staff in his right hand, a stick. And they knelt in front of him and they mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews. And then they spit on him. And then they took his staff from him, hit him on the head again and again. So the thorns would be driven in and blood would come down his face. After they mocked him, they took off his robe and put on his own clothes. And then they took him away to hang him on the cross and crucify him. So he's on the cross. He's hanging there. And people are passing by, hurling insults at him. They say, they're shaking their heads and shaking their fists at him. You know, hey, save yourself. You said you come down, and three days later you rise again and build the temple. Show yourself. Come on down from there, big guy. If you're the son of God. And then John 2, I just love when he talks about uh, Jesus talking to his disciples. He's like, look. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. He's like, go ahead and kill me. But I'm coming back. Jesus dies on the cross. Three days later, he comes back to life. Now that's power. And I love how he does it. The women go to the tomb, and there's an angel. and says, he's not here. So they go running. They're going to go tell the disciples. And they're running away in chapter 28 of Matthew. I love chapter 28. And I hope you love it. Jesus is risen. And they're running out. And I just love this part. I'm sure. so the women are hurried away from the tomb, afraid that they were filled with joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. And suddenly, Jesus came. Says, greetings. <laughs> Man, that's just, that's just, uh, that's Clint Eastwood right there. <laughs> greetings. All right, and then here's how Matthew 20 ends. Jesus says, he says, Man, I'm powerful. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All the authorities. Therefore, he says, here's what you're supposed to do. Go and make some disciples of all nations. Go and tell people about it. That's what you're supposed to do. Go tell people about it. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing means just dumping them under the water. Dumping them. Just fully immersing and fully making them mine. Not just a little part of them, but just 
Dunk them all the way out of the water. Make them mine. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, then I want you to teach them to say these two magic words. Get it ahead. He doesn't say that. It's teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. What are you supposed to do? Just obey everything I told you. All of it. Okay. Don't just take some of the words you don't like and say, well, that part we're going to ignore. He says, what I'd really like to encourage you today is just to think, it all matters. They're all some aspect of Jesus. The compassion of Jesus, there's plenty of that here too. Right? He loves you. He was compassionate with you. He loved people. He was nice. But he was also a Jesus that knew who he was. And didn't want to be so nice to people that they didn't see who he really was. He wanted to tell people, this is who I really am. Take me or leave me. If you love your mom too much, more than me, I am all powerful and I deserve it all. He's not mixing words here. He's saying, I am that person. I am God made man. And he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I heard this quote the other the other day, and I just put it on Facebook, and it's um, Jay Vernon McGee. He's dead now, but he said that. This is God's universe. He does things his way. Now, you may have a better way of doing things, but you don't have a better universe. So he gets to tell us who he is, right? It's all written here, right? This is how you find out about it. And then, later on, I'm just going to end with this one slide. John, one of his disciples, goes and sees Jesus. He's given a vision. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus writes, God says, this is what Jesus says. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I die, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And now I have the keys of death. When John saw him, John fell down. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, get up. And I love that fear not part that really stood out to me. He said, fear not, don't be afraid. He says, look, I said some harsh things because they're true. He said, but the fear not part makes me think, I don't have to be afraid. Because I'm on his side. I've asked him into my heart. He loves me. And I'm not opposed to him. The ones who are supposed to fear him, fear him are those who are opposed to him. Those who love him. Those who accepted him. And those who he's, he's regenerated and changed. We don't have to fear him. He says, and I have the keys to death and evil. He's like, I've got you. Don't worry. Don't worry about dying. Be fearless. I want to serve a God that is powerful. So I can lean into him and he's got me covered. If he's a whip of a God, then I'm on my own. He's like, I've got you. I have the keys to death and Hades. You don't have to be afraid at all. So I keep reminding myself, have no fear. And I want you to know, you don't have to have any fear at all. Now let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. I know there was a lot of scripture here, Lord, but we just want to see an overview of who you are. Some of them are hard things, Lord, that I picked out some hard verses that we don't like to think about. We didn't really have time to get into them and expand on them. But I'll, Lord, I pray that it drives us to want to study the word more, to investigate. Lord, if any of these students don't know you and they want to know more about you, I pray that they come and talk to me or one of the other faculty. Just say, who's this Jesus that you're talking about? I need to know him. I want to be his friend. Not his friend. Lord, help us to study more about you, to lean into you, to love you. And Lord, go with these students today in the power of Jesus and know that you have them and you have to control the keys to death and hades. And we can rely on you and not fear about our exams, not fear about our lives, what we're going to be doing with our futures, not fear of death. Lord, you have us. You are in control. Lord, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody.